Holy happy hour, Batman. I am Father Ben. I'm an Episcopal priest, and I am co-founder of the All Ports Open Network. On this show, Holy Happy Hour, Batman, I am joined by heroes of the gaming and geek world to talk about life, faith, spirituality, game design philosophy, uh, the TTRPG industry, and whatever else happens to come up. Tonight, we have a very special two-part episode. I'm super excited about this. We're here at a special time this week. Uh, we're doing this particular episode sort of late night TV show style. So my first guest in just a few minutes is Tyler Cumran of Possible World Games. Um, you might know games like, um, well, as we're going to talk about Beak, Feather, and Bone, um, which is right now there is a new Kickstarter going on for Beak, Feather, and Bone Claw Atlas, which we'll we're going to get to we're going to talk all about i've wanted to have tyler on for a long time so i'm really excited um to have him on in just a few minutes and we're going to talk about possible worlds and the current kickstarter and all kinds of stuff so it should be really exciting so that's just our first guest because at 8 p.m eastern time Tyler is going to stick around, and we're going to be joined by another awesome designer. Nevin Holmes is going to join us. You might know Nevin from designing Just a Car, which is a four-player courtroom drama TTRPG, or uh, their game Gun and Slinger, which is a game about a weapon and a wanderer. Uh, I'm a really big fan of um, uh, The Dark Tower, so... I'm excited to talk a little bit about Gun and Slinger, but we're going to talk to both Tyler and Nevin about their work together and even the work maybe that they've done together. Um, it's going to be really fun. So if you're in the chat hanging out with us, prep your questions. Uh, we have a really awesome two-hour special episode tonight, so hold on tight. Don't go anywhere. We're in for a really fun ride, so uh, make sure you stick around for all that goodness. But before we get into the show itself, uh, I do have some really important housekeeping items, of course, here at the top of the show. This show, Holy Happy Hour Batman, is a production of the All Ports Open Network. You can head to allportsopen.com to check out all of our podcasts and streams. Uh, tonight, uh, which if you're watching this live, is Monday, June 13th, uh, right after this show at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the All Ports Open Twitch channel. It is the next session of One Night at Slumpos, which is the current Monday Night Horror stream of the worst days going on at the APON Twitch channel. Uh, the Worst Days, if you don't know, is a horror TTRPG about being young, written by JWG Wise, my APON co founder. It's been in playtest for well over a year. I've kind of lost track, maybe two years. Um, it's been a long time. And there are two uh, playtest streams. They were weekly. Uh, now I think they're every other week, but they are Monday and Tuesday nights on the Apon Twitch channel. And you can find that also Apon Games on YouTube uh, if you want to catch up on those. And the Monday Night Crew, which is a blast, really great crew on Monday nights, they are playing a horror story I'm working at a sci-fi pizza joint called Slumpos, I guess. So anyway, tonight after Holy Happy Hour Batman, we're going to raid into that show. So you can stick around here and we're going to raid right into the One Night at Slumpos Monday Night Stream. Should be a really good time. So make sure you stick around for that. Speaking of Apon and Apon Games, Apon Games is the game publishing kind of arm of the All Ports Open Network. And we just completed our first itch funding campaign successfully for The Hard Lessons, which is a game Josh wrote uh, and I did some layout work for. Uh, and uh, so we successfully funded a finished version of The Hard Lessons and we funded some stretch goals. We had a character record sheet stretch goal and then two playset stretch goals for the game. We're making a pirate playset and a superhero playset. So really exciting. Thanks to everybody that supported the hard lessons uh, that helped us have a successful itch funding campaign to kind of get Apon Games off the ground as a game publishing company. We're really excited about that. And so speaking of that, we are prepping everything for our next uh, crowdfunding campaign. This is for a game that I wrote. It's sort of my baby. It's sort of my heart. Uh, it's very special and important to me. This game is called Broken a tragic romance game uh, and it is going to be coming to itch.io as a itch fund game in July. Broken, if you don't know about it yet from hearing me talk about it or seeing me tweet about it, Broken is a romance game for two players in which you tell the story of a relationship. It's cute. You like tell how you kind of met, what you are into about each other in this relationship, uh, what you're attracted to about each other. You explore that new relationship energy. But it's not just any romance or relationship game. 
it is a tragic one because every game of Broken ends up the same way with a breakup. So over 10 scenes, you slowly become disillusioned with each other until you finally, in the last scene, break up your relationship. Broken is about broken hearts, broken people, and broken objects. As the core mechanic of the game Broken, you break physical objects that you have in front of you that serve as scene prompts. So uh, that's my game Broken. Uh, and if you want to join us in helping it become a reality, you can um, this summer, starting in July. I believe the campaign's going to launch on July 19th. There is a couple ways you can kind of follow the game. You can go to Apon Games on itch.io and follow us there so you can see when our games get, you know, go live. Um, but in the meantime, if you want to like learn more or get updates as um, we prep everything for the campaign or get details, um, we have an email list. It's buttondown.email forward slash that gamer priest. And I will link that in the chat and I will link it in the show notes uh, for this episode uh, if you want to follow along and get updates and all that good stuff. So uh, let me just drop that in the chat. There we go. Oh, so uh, it is happy hour. I almost forgot because I forgot to drop it in my notes. Like I usually rely on my notes. It is happy hour. And as you can see, we've got a cocktail here on the screen. I've got two... I've got two possible worlds cocktails for y'all tonight. I decided to do two possible worlds inspired cocktail. I could have done a lot more. Sometimes I get carried away once I start designing them, like making them um, like any good designer, I suppose. And anyway, so I was thinking about beak, feather, and bone. And I was like, okay, what what is a good, for whatever reason, the BFB got stuck in my head. And I said, okay, well, what if I made a BFB cocktail? What would it be? So this is, Brandy, Falernum, and Benedictine. That's my B, my BFB cocktail. Brandy, Falernum, and Benedictine. So uh, you can see it's on the screen. It's two ounces of brandy, one ounce of Falernum syrup, one ounce of Benedictine. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to throw those in the cocktail shaker with a whole ton of ice, shake it up really good, get it nice and mixed well and chilled, and then you're going to pour it. I would personally pour it over ice in a low ball glass probably, uh, and, and then um, – you can garnish it with uh, mint, a mint sprig, le a lemon wedge, you know, kind of bring out some of the aromas from that. Um, and th that the aromas will kind of combine the Forum and Benedictine pretty well if you do that. You could also serve this up. You can see I have a picture of the martini glass there. You could serve this up in a martini glass and still garnish it the same way or just sort of throw a little mint sprig on top of it when you're drinking it or whatever. And so, yeah, that's the, that's the first one, the BFB cocktail. Uh, inspired by Beak, Feather, and Bone, which is on Kickstarter right now for Call Atlas, which is kind of like a, I guess it's an expansion. We'll ask Tyler if it counts as an expansion or what the right wording is for that in just a minute when Tyler's on. Uh, I do have one more cocktail to share, though, based on, I was going to show everybody my box set of the Possible Worlds games, that, but I packed it because I'm moving. So it's sealed in a box, so I couldn't show it off. But uh, one of the games, I love all the games from Possible Worlds games. It's a proud addition to my game shelf. One of the games I love from Possible Worlds is Single Unique Power, which is um, kind of my, my kids are really, really obsessed with My Hero Academia. And Single Unique Power has a lot in common with, with, with My Hero Academia. And so I wanted to make a Single Unique Power inspired drink. Now, this is a really special cocktail. This is a Holy Happy Hour Batman first because I gamified a cocktail for the first time. Let me, I don't know if y'all will be able to read this. It's really hard for me to tell. Let me switch over to Twitch. You see, you can kind of read that there. Um, all right. I gamified a cocktail for the first time. This is the single unique spirit inspired by, inspired by a single unique power for possible world games. And you're going to gamify your cocktail by rolling a D six to determine your single unique spirit. And then you're going to roll a D four to determine your juice. Uh, and then you're going to add a half ounce of simple syrup. And it's a really simple cocktail because it's just a spirit, uh, a, uh, a juice, and um, simple syrup to sweet, but sweeten it up. A combination which is nearly perfect, I will say. Um, so you can see on there, you can roll a D6 to get yourself a gin, a whiskey, a rum, a vodka, a brandy, or a tequila, a D4 to get either lime, lemon, orange, or grapefruit juice, and then you add the simple syrup. So I would chill this really well by combining it into a shaker, uh, cocktail shaker with ice, get it nice and cold, and then serve it. I don't know. You can serve it over ice. You can serve it up. It depends on kind of, I guess, what you end up, uh, 
which spirit you end up with. I mean, either way, it's going to be good. It's going to be really good, I promise. So, hey, same thing as always. If anyone tries any of these cocktails, you got to let me know. Tweet about it. Send me a DM, whatever. Let me know if you try it. We'd love to hear about it. And I will share these cocktail recipe cards on Twitter uh, in just a little bit. If you don't follow me on Twitter, I am Benjamin Wallace on Twitter. So, all right, I'm going to – let's get Tyler on the show because I know that's why everybody's here. So let me just get rid of the recipe card. There it goes. And let me switch over to having Tyler on the show. Tyler, welcome to Holy Happy Hour, Batman. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Ben. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for making the time during your very busy crowdfunding campaign to uh, come on the show. Yeah, it's crowdfunding's weird. It poisons your brain. Um, I don't know how much I would recommend it to anyone, uh, except unless you need to operate within capitalism, in which case it is better than some other ways of making money. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. I'm really grateful that the campaign is going as well as it is that I can be kind of operating from a place of persistence rather than panic. Uh, but it is still one of those things where it's like, all right. Well, I've got 30 days where my efforts are multiplied by some invisible algorithm that yeah. says it might reach more people than the 30 days after. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm happy to be here to talk about the game some, but also just, yeah, we've uh, messaged each other some, oh gosh, uh, been bro. in a lot of the same circles. <laughs> and For a long time, yeah. Yeah, just... It hasn't happened, yeah. and I'm happy to finally be here. Ooh, yeah, and thank too. you also for double cocktail, double cocktail all the way across the sky. And it's not to mention a gamified one. I, I, say, I will be playing that. Okay, yeah. awesome. I was going to say, it's a really special. I don't know why it never occurred to me before. It just When I realized it today, I was like, oh, my gosh, it's the most obvious thing I could have done at any point in the last year of doing this show to gamify a cocktail. But something about the idea of the single unique power – and I, because, okay, a little backdrop on this for, I don't know how much you like cocktails, but one of the, um, one of my favorite ways to drink rum is, because I love rum, if people don't know this, rum's my favorite spirit, um, I think because it's the most adaptable, it's the most diverse spirit in the world, there's like a billion versions of rum, believe it or not, out there for people who, you know, may not know that, but rum is, one of the ways you can serve rum is called, um, I don't remember the French phrase, but it is a French phrase from the Isle of St. Martin, right? And it's like this idea, it's called like, like, um, make your own death or something, or like, serve okay. your own death. All right, and, I'd play that. Yeah, so what they do is they give you a bottle of rum, they give you sugar, and, um, and like a glass with ice, and, and a lime, a whole lime, and a knife. And you just combine them however you want like it's just sugar lime and rum which is one of god's greatest gifts to the world uh and but you combine them to sort of to your own ratio that you want and yeah. um it's called like making your own death or something and i was thinking about single unique power and i was like i like this idea of like just highlighting a single spirit and i don't know it just popped into my head to, to roll for it and then well thank you, know. you. i i really appreciate it i um didn't drink much until I was already an adult. And so I I never had like a learning cocktails phase. And so I've always just relied on friends, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like friends. I, I worked in theater for about a decade. And so you wind up uh, getting to know a lot of people who are bartenders at one point or another. Uh, and so I'd be like at a friend's house playing board games and like, Tyler, would you like a drink? Uh, what do you want? I was like, I would like a dessert please <laughs> they're like i would like a sipping drink um there's actually a bar here in pittsburgh i don't remember the name but my uh partner and i went to it for um a friend's birthday party and they don't let you order your own cocktails they just are like hey we have some like really good infused liquors and pick the thing that speaks to you and we will make you something that highlights it. I love um, that. And both of us were were super pleased. Oh, I wish uh, it was so a place you're, like that around here. I love that. Yeah, you're you're doing the Lord's work. <laughs> if if I when I make it out to Pittsburgh next, I'll have to try to find that place. Uh, so that's the other thing is Tyler and I are both Pennsylvanians. I often yes. weirdly seem to end up with people on the show who are on the other side of the state. Well, that's the thing. People don't realize that Pennsylvania is really wide. Like you can fit multiple European countries inside of Pennsylvania. Uh, so any band 
that like is like oh we hit philly that that counts check pennsylvania off the list uh pittsburgh is hours and hours away oh yeah it's almost as far for me to go to Pittsburgh as it is for me to visit my daughter who lives in Maine. Yeah. It's it's really it's a lot. almost as far. So one of my best friends and um, a uh, frequent watcher of this show, I don't know if he's watching right now, but lives out in Pittsburgh. And um, so, you know, the next time I get out there, I, I actually – oh, there you go. My wife commented in the chat that uh, – She's telling us something about the uh, drinking your death thing that I mentioned, the Le Petit Mort. Oh, interesting. I did not know that. So if the chat has informed us that it also is how the French say orgasm, apparently, is Le oh, Petit Mort. Oh, great. So little death. So apparently <laughs> Even more a, divine. I mean, honestly, drinking rum and lime and sugar together is <laughs> it's a lot like that. You're going to get there one way or another. <laughs> exactly. But... Yeah. So anyway, uh, do, uh, do you happen to remember the if name? If you, of the yeah, if you do, I don't remember the name, but if yeah. you do the effort of getting out to Pittsburgh, I will do the effort of finding out the name Thank of you. one bar. I'm sure I'll be in Pittsburgh. It's just a question of when I will be in Pittsburgh. You know, yeah. Uh, I, I have one. I won't say when it is, but in the fall, there's a reason why I will be in Pittsburgh. Whether I'll have time to go to a bar or not while while we're doing that, I don't know. But we are going there for an event. Nice. My wife is looking at me like I'm crazy, but she'll remember what it is later. She can also check the calendar. Yeah, her ADD means she forgets these details a lot. Um, anyway, uh, Pennsylvania is a great place. Pittsburgh is such an awesome city. I yeah. love Pittsburgh. It is a real special place in my heart as like the other side of the state. Yeah. Sorry, my wife is over there. She remembered why we're going there in the fall. Oh, okay. I didn't want All to right. call anybody's personal life out, but we're going there for a special celebration. Let's just say that. Nice. Um, but yeah, I love Pittsburgh. It's such a great city. Yeah. No, I agree. It's it's especially for artists. It is. Yeah. Um, it's one of the few cities where it is the rent is affordable enough that you can be an artist and you can experiment and uh, not have it be quite as sink or swim as other cities. I've spent some time in DC. Um, I lived in New York for a little while and there's just a certain sink or swim quality uh, that if you don't put, you know, your like whole heart into something and be like, well, you know, I'm putting all chips on this, then it just, it doesn't make sense. Um, whereas in Pittsburgh, like, you can rent an art gallery. We have an yeah. abundance of abandoned buildings. Uh, you can do things yeah. uh, and it will not necessarily ruin you uh, yeah. if the biggest thing you get out of it is a learning experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so actually that makes me think of like one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about, which is sort of your, because this just kind of interests me. We can, maybe we should plug Beak, Feather and Bone first because I talk a little bit about that. But I, what I want to talk about is just your business model, what you're trying to accomplish with not just possible. Yeah, rules, I but, think yeah. I can I can weave that together sure. for you. Yeah. So um, like I casually mentioned, I worked in theater for about a decade uh, professionally. I was what's called a dramaturg. Uh, so it is the most pretentious title in theater. <laughs> A lot of theaters don't have one, and even if they do, they probably don't know what it does. Okay. Um, a dramaturg is to a new play what an editor is to a new novel. Oh, okay. Uh, so I would be doing a lot of new play development type stuff on the ground with playwrights, uh, editing scenes. Uh, sometimes that looks like a writing partner. Sometimes that looks like a, a research assistant you know i'd be the one going to libraries to make sure that like okay if we are going to make this reference um it doesn't really matter to what the playwright is doing uh whether or not it is completely historically accurate you know if they're just focusing on the characters right now uh, but it might matter to an audience member who is an expert on the thing they're talking about uh, so sometimes my job as a dramaturg was to be like the connective tissue between the story that the playwright was trying to tell and the audience and just make sure that that pipeline was as clear as possible. Um, so I did that for about a decade, um, kind of worked my way up the ladder, uh, worked off Broadway for a while, um, got to a point where I was like, okay, it makes more sense for me to go into New York every couple months and crash on a couch than to be paying for the myth of New York full time. Came back to Pittsburgh. Um, pandemic hits and suddenly the 10 years of momentum I built up uh, is down the drain. Uh, 
um, because like I said, very specialized role. And the way that my livelihood worked is I would have, you know, half a dozen theaters that would be like, okay, it's our turn for Tyler. You know, maybe we have one show in the season that needs his particular set of skills. Um, and so I would bounce from theater to theater and be like, okay, I pay my rent this way. Uh, but when the pandemic hit, a lot of the theaters, uh, if they had full-time staff at all, um, they really circled the wagons to make sure that those staff members' livelihood was not affected. You know, maybe there were some pay cuts, but they were like, we're not laying you off. We are just not going to hire any more freelancers. And we are going to ask you to do the kind of work that we usually like have a discretionary budget to bring them in for. Yeah. Um, which is all well and good, makes sense. Um, but it was really tough for me yeah. uh, because, you know, I'm like staring down the barrel of months of rent and not sure what I'm going to do next. Uh, I had already been in the RPG space as a hobbyist, um, you know, got into it through playing games with friends, listening to podcasts, you know, that old song and dance. Sure. Um, and I was the forever GM uh, for a lot of games. And then also I had already started to get a little bit of work in, in the RPG space too. Uh, World Champ Game Co., Adam Voss, uh, they were really you know, the first person to take a chance on me brought me on to edit some of their books because I was someone who had experience doing professional literature editing. Um, but I also like knew what it meant when D20 was on a page, you know? So Adam did not need me to fix the game. Mm. Um, what Adam did need is someone who knew like commas and sentence structure and clarity and things like that, yeah. but also wouldn't get hung up on gaming jargon. Yeah. So I was playing hobbyist, uh, doing some game design on the side. Um, and what I had found is that as a GM, it was really inefficient for me to prep games because I would have like a map and I would start to just like write down what was behind every door of that map. And it was exhausting. Um, and our players would maybe go into one of those buildings, you yeah. know, regardless of how many entries I wrote. Yeah. And also it was it just, it wasn't fun. You know, mm -hmm. I think there was a certain point, uh, where, and this is not going to be a D and D bashing show. I know it's, it's, it works great for a lot of people, yeah. but it will be a Wizards of the Coast bashing show. Sure. Um, <laughs> That's so, the line that we walk on this show all the time. Which, yeah. Which so is, the thing really is, DD, um, but we have bashed Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. There is no uh, economic fiscal uh, motivator for Dungeons and Dragons to ever become any simpler um, because it is in the interest of D&D &D to perpetuate the myth that being a GM is a big complicated thing and that you have to write Lord of the Rings for any game you play. Yeah. Uh, because as long as that myth is perpetuated, then they can sell you source books. Right. You know, like if you believe that l being a good gem, a good GM is knowing what's behind every door, then it becomes a much more attractive uh, proposition to buy the book that is 600 pages long and tells you what's behind every door yeah. instead of doing that like soul crushing work yourself yeah because it's it's like you know writing a book of poetry for your friends and putting like your whole heart into every poem but they only read one of them before going home yeah <laughs> or like they more accurately they read one and they're like oh shoot i'm gonna write my own poems like that's fun too but it's also like oh kind of wanted someone to see my other stuff so that's where beak feather and bone came in I'd commissioned this map from Jonathan Yee a while ago when I thought that the way to break into RPGs was going to be to write one of those setting Bibles. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had this map. I was running this campaign for my friends uh, set at this map. And I realized that it was a lot more fun if I kind of democratized the elements of GM prep. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a blank, unlabeled map. And what I came up with was a game where you'd get a set of coloring utensils and a deck of cards. You'd get some very loose prompts for like, okay, you draw a six of diamonds. That means uh, diamonds you need to color in a building for a financial, uh, that serves a financial purpose and like its influence is six. And then 
because I also had commissioned these uh, Kenku portraits for this city as like the flavor from Austin Breed, I was like, all right, well, how do I use these assets I already have? And I came up with Beak, Feather, and Bone as the labeling device for this game. Beak being, what do people say about this building? Feather being, what does it look like on the outside? Bone being, what does it look like on the inside? Or what is its, you know, hidden yeah. purpose? Yeah. Um, so this is a game that I made on the side really as a way to make GMing more tenable for me and also make GMing more attractive to other play groups, you know, or even if like it is not used as prep, you know, a game that shows people how world building can be fun, yeah. you know, beyond just like giving it to someone as homework. Absolutely. So I take this game and it was during the second zine quest, I think it was. Okay. Um, my theater career is disappearing, like, as I spoke, and I was already like a little frustrated with it. I specialize in some real weird theater, um, specifically impossible theater. Okay. Uh, so that would be a play that needs to be a play. It reads as a play, like there is choreography happening on the page, but that choreography is so complex that it might be impossible to actually stage it. <laughs> um, so it really walks uh -huh. the line between poetry and play. Okay. Um, but I put up this Kickstarter with a goal of $1,000. Um, and it raised 20 yeah. and suddenly beak feather and bone paid my rent for the year, mm. uh, and continued sales, like helped to pick up the slack too. So going into 2021, I had the option of trying to claw my way back into theater or ride the momentum that I already had. Um, and if I was going to do it, I was going to do it right. I was going to start an LLC. I was going to, you know, go through yeah. branding exercises, stop just being like a guy. Um, and I was like, I'm launching Possible Worlds games. Mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on what I'm good at, what people want from me, which is 30 page games yeah. that are approachable, uh, but unique enough that there's a hook for longtime players. Yeah. Uh, and also like simple enough mechanics that you can run it a bunch of times over, yeah. whether it's a one shot or as a mini game within other games. So I do a box set of six games, uh, introducing people to kind of my house style, uh, that campaign does well enough that I'm like, all right, it's my full-time job now. Yeah. And so now um, we're here in 2022 and a lot of indie designers, the way they go about things is you keep putting out small games in hopes that one of them will be the breadwinner, you know, uh, one of them will be the one that really hooks people's attention and helps fund the other games. And what I found is that Beak, Feather and Bone you know, seven games deep was still my most popular game. Mm -hmm. There was something about it that just really spoke to people. Yeah. Um, and what's more, people were discovering it all the time. Yeah. But the original game, it has the rules and it has one map for you to use. So there are some people finding the game and there are other people that have played the game maybe once, twice, however many times before they started needing to find or create their own maps. Mm. So I got back in touch with the original uh, artists awesome breed uh, for the character art, Jonathan Yee for the maps. And yeah, I commissioned what I would say is an expansion to Beak, Feather, and Bone. Okay. Uh, they are blank maps that you use the Beak, Feather, and Bone rules to play, but they're in completely different biomes. The first one was like a desert crater. This one we have like weird space dimensions. Uh, we have like cliff sides, we have forests, we have uh, cities built inside the rib cages of giant skeletons really cool stuff. Uh, and I also added a couple of optional rules uh, for new ways to play the game along with the two new factions that Austin added. But also like maps are just cool, you know? Like part of why I want to be intentional about saying that like, I have no ill will towards Dungeons and Dragons is because like it is for a lot of people, the Kleenex of TTRPGs, Yeah, you know, like People say they want to play Dungeons and Dragons, um, but what they really want is a tissue, you know? Right. They don't necessarily care about the brand name, but it is the one that is the most accessible. Yeah. And it is the one that, like, by virtue of the, like, stranger thingsification of pop culture, yeah. uh, I think my favorite Dungeons and Dragons campaign 
is not the one that uh, follows the rules to the letter of the book. It's just the person who has seen enough TV shows with Dungeons and Dragons scenes in it yeah. that they're like, hey, let's play Dungeons and Dragons the same way someone says, hey, let's play Hopscotch. Yes. And they're like, yeah. I'm pretty sure I know all the rules, but if right. we get to something we don't know, then we'll just like improvise. Yeah. Um, and there is something like really pure about that. And so I don't begrudge, you know, a game that is able to occupy that brain space for people yeah. um, as long as, you know, it is not at the expense of telling me to like get out of here my, with my weird bird game. <laughs> well, yeah. So I do see sometimes people, indie TTRPG people and designers kind of getting, uh, I don't know what words to use. They get a little bit, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> it kind of rubs them the wrong way to think that way. Like, because I see a lot of the discourse being like, uh, well, if you're not going to play D and D accurately or to the rules, why are you playing D and D? Because there's all these other indie games out there. Yeah. But I know this is a discourse that's happening all the time. So we, anyone who's familiar with the discourse and watching this, maybe is tired of this conversation because I kind of am. But you know, there's a lot of like, should that be the attitude about D and D, or should what you just articulated be the attitude? And I personally don't see a reason to bash the thing that brings many people into our hobby like it's just not i'm just i play look i play D D almost exclusively i've been playing ttrpgs i've been a hobbyist for like 20 years right for the first 10 of that i think it was probably just D D, right so like i'm gonna bash the thing that i did for 10 years you know what about the next person who's coming along and that's their entryway like why would i bash yeah. that's where i was why would i bash them for doing that um, so I don't see a reason to do the bashing, but, but it's more, I think that it's more of a question of like, how do we introduce new people to the indie level of the hobby? And that's really yeah. to me where there's a good conversation to have about. Yeah. A know. lot of how I try and do that, um, you know, beak feather and bone is probably my most bespoke game. Um, like, and it's the one that like, you kind of need to have the rule book and also like the maps that come with it uh, to play. Uh, so if there was an equivalent for a polyhedral dice with my game, it would be like, you need a blank map and it's not hard to create or find your own, but it is something that is like specific that this game requires. But a lot of my other games, I try to practice what I call dollar store design. Yeah. Where like, I want to design games that, don't require any materials that you couldn't find at a dollar store. Okay. You know, whether it is six sided dice, yeah. you know, or a deck of cards or, you know, tokens, anything that you would be able to like in an average community, not have a specialist store and still be able to get them. Uh, otherwise I do theater of the mind type stuff. Well, um, but my two greatest play testers for my games are one, um, my younger brother, who is a farmer, a welder, does not own any weird dice, but is a fantastic storyteller. And I will play a lot of my games with him because like if Luke is given the tools that he needs to tell a good story with this, great, I'm doing my job. Like I am giving him inspiration without getting in his way. Uh, and the other group that I play test most of my games with these days is uh, I run an after school program for the community library here in Millvale, um, the little borough that I'm in in Pittsburgh. And it is a mix of middle schoolers and like freshmen in high school. And I'm like, all right, great. You know, a, for a lot of these people, this is D and D for them. Yeah. Like they said they wanted to play D and D and what they got was me. <laughs> um, so at like each session we will do like storytelling games sometimes we will do um more intense games we're kind of easing them into other systems they recently asked they were like we want to play with the weird dice um so i introduced them to into the odd electric fashion land just like a simple dice mechanic um but yeah it's it's all interesting but it's also all very similar to what my old career used to be mm. you know i'm still just facilitating storytelling yeah like i'm still just clearing out the uh like 
the narrative pipeline mm. that is between the text and the player. Mm. You know, if I am the playwright of like the kind of like the zone that the story is going to live in, I want to make sure that my intent is as clear to the player as possible without having any of those like weird specific words that might hang them up. I think mm. the best definition I've heard of tabletop role playing games was um, Epidia. I always butcher his last name. Yep. Ravical. Epidia um, Ravishal. Yeah. Ravishal. Former guest. I never know show. with this age. Yeah. Epi's great. Yeah. Um, he's awesome. But he once like defined RPGs as algorithms for emergent storytelling. Mm. You know, you have a left side of the equation uh, where you have fixed values and you have variables. And a well-designed game, you know, whatever players put into vari those variables, you know, the equation that you've built is going to, like, run it through the plus, minus, or divide with the fixed numbers, and you are going to have an acceptable range on the other side of the kind of story you're trying to tell, whether it is a comedy, a tragedy, a romance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, with playwriting, it is just, you know, a much more fixed equation. Mm. And the things that actors are bringing to it is like the variables are just like the spin you put on the lines. Mm. Whereas RPGs are the opposite end of that spectrum where it's like everything, you know, comes from the player yeah. and the spin is what the designer is providing. Yeah, yeah. That's, an that's a really interesting way of thinking about it. I was actually discussing this kind of subject earlier on an interview I was doing for a podcast for Broken, and I was, like, talking about Broken. And I, one of the things about my game that I've been talking about, and it kind of – I would plug the show, but the first episode of the show doesn't exist yet, so there's really not a lot to plug. But uh, uh, So you should yeah. – people should follow your Twitter so that when yes. you can plug it, they are yeah. prepared. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we were talking about, I, I've been talking about Broken as being more than just a game. It's also like a memoir for mm -hmm. me of my own divorce and my own divorce story. And I tell some of my story in the like letter from the author at the start of the game. But to me, the whole game, including the game itself and all of the playing that people will do when they play it, I see that, I know this is going to sound strange to people, but I see that all as being kind of my memoir because mm -hmm. like the yeah. way I felt like I needed to tell my divorce story was through lots of people telling completely unique and different breakup stories in a certain framework. So hearing you articulate it that way makes me think about that helps me with like kind of get at what I was tr getting at with my thought process about that, which is like, what I really mean is I created the parameters for telling yeah. certain stories. And that is what I consider to be like my divorce memoir is like the parameters around other people creating and telling their own divorce stories. And I, I was trying to articulate that in that interview earlier today, and I didn't have all of the language, but I really appreciate that language. I think it's such a cool way of thinking about role-playing games. It makes me think of um, autobiographical plays too, in a way, mm -hmm. uh, because there's something very vulnerable about, you know, it's one thing to write an like autobiographical play that is like a one woman show and you are performing that show and is you telling that story. There's a very different situation when you start to give that script to other people yeah. and let them start performing that show uh, because they are going to be saying your words. They are going to be embodying um, your experience and you're putting a lot of trust in them to kind of like, one, understand your story by going through the ritual of acting it out. Um, and also like you are trusting them to pass that story along to an audience. And I think that with like autobiographical games, you know, you're not necessarily telling people to tell your story, but you are asking them to sit with your emotions in some very specific ritualized ways. Um, and yeah, that is, you know, a, a kind of game design that I think is really interesting in the like lyric game space and the solo game space um you know in the like small uh like crystallized games that are like you know able to kind of tap into a specific kind of emotion yeah. uh, part of why i designed 30 page games is because like one i it's not a good value proposition for me to put all of the time and energy into writing a 300 page book you know because who knows like if it's going to be the thing 
that uh, really catches on. Mm. Uh, mm. But also, like, the 300-page books exist. Yeah. Like, you can go and find, like, any fantasy heartbreaker at any gaming store. And if you don't want the $60 one, I guarantee they have a $3 one in the bin in the back. Yeah. Um, I am more interested in creating games that recreate like a specific like niche genre yeah. or a specific kind of feeling. Yeah. Um, like a favorite game of mine uh, is dating.sim. Yeah. That is really just like me saying like, I have a blast watching the Bachelor Bachelorette franchise with my friends. And I want to make a game where you are able to like play out the comedy of this, the sincere moments that show up unexpectedly, and also just the fascinating layer of like, are people here for the right reasons or yeah. not? Or are they just trying to get Instagram followers? Yeah. Yeah. I, Dating .sim, so for listeners, for what viewers of this right now, they don't know this, but Dating.sim is kind of how I started getting into Possible Worlds games. It's how I kind of put you on my map or my radar. It was actually, I think it might have been because we're good friends with Heart Points, um, with mm -hmm. Zach and Diana yeah. from Heart Points, and they live in our area. And uh, Zach actually went to the same later, but graduated from the same high school as me. Like we're from the same hometown. Nice. And, um, and actually, Zach's on the team. He's the editor for Broken. So uh, just to plug Zach and Diana there. Yeah, they're fantastic. They're awesome. They're, they're just some of the best. We've done um, panels with them uh, at cons and stuff. So they kind of turned me on. Zach kind of turned me on to Beak, Feather, and Bone, and then to the whatever the Kickstarter was for the the box set. The box set, set. Mm -hmm. yeah. I the know Possible that Worlds a, box set. Okay, Possible Worlds box set. That's right. So, uh, but dating, we were wrapping up season two of our show, Pot of Love, that my spouse and I do together. And... So we were wrapping up season and dating dot sim is like a perfect pot of love game. It's like it's one of the games, you know, we want people to write so we can play them on that show. Yeah. But we were wrapping up season two and we didn't get to fit a game of dating dot sim into season two. And it was heartbreaking because they really wanted to. And if we do if slash when we do a season three of Pot of Love, it's gonna it's like the top of the list of games to Nice. Yeah. Can I count you on the list? I'm trying to make a list of romance game designers. Um can I include you on my list of romance yes, game designers? Yes, please. Awesome. Please. In like, fact, I even made a – for people watching this, again, people can go hang out there because it's just me right now. I made a romance TTRPG subreddit in the hopes that people would – because there's like a ton more romance games than there used to be, like tons. I've got to say the Reddit scares me. Yeah, it scares, scares me real me. bad. Yeah. Um, I mean <laughs> yeah. my uh, – I have a cat named Ziggy. Okay. Um, I adopted Ziggy during my Kickstarter campaign last year uh, because I just start. I wanted a cat for a while. I had a roommate who had a cat, and then that roommate got married, uh, so I was catless. Uh, and uh -huh. um, I started just saying like loudly to my closest friends, "If this Kickstarter funds, I will adopt a cat." Okay. Because I knew that they would hold me to it. Uh huh. And before the campaign was even done, like once we crashed crashed the uh, crossed the funding part, there was still like ten days left. Um, yeah, one of those friends started texting me like adoption links. <laughs> and so I adopted Ziggy. I've had him for just about a year now, but I hand assemble all of the box sets, all of the, um, yeah. beak, feather and bone comes in a little plastic, uh, resealable baggie that has the zine game and then three loose maps, you know, so that you can like use them without feeling precious about it. I know anytime I get like, uh, an artifact of play with uh, an RPG, I never touch it because I'm afraid of ruining it. Mm. Um, so mm. I was just like, I'm going to include three so that people can do that. And oh, I will be awesome. including two of each map uh, with the 10 new maps included in Claw Atlas. So it's going to be 20 maps total. That's awesome. Um, wow. But uh, anyway, so Ziggy was helping me uh, pack up these boxes <laughs> because there are lots of squares when yeah. I do this. And if there's a square, he wants to sit on it. Sure. Um, and so I take a couple pictures. I send them to my partner. And she posts them on, I think it's r slash cats with jobs, okay. something like that. Oh, no. Um, and not even like oh, calling no. out uh, my process, but it blows up. It got like 3,000 upvotes. Wow. Like everyone is saying like, oh, my gosh, this is so great. He's such a great worker. And like my partner's responding like, yeah, Ziggy takes um, OSHA very seriously. He's a uh, really good quality control. Um, and eventually, eventually, like down the thread of comments people were like hey so what is ziggy packing like those kind of look like books like are those books are like it's so 
it says possible worlds games on that one is it like a board game company and so my partner is like well actually uh you can find these games on at possiblewordsgames.com or you can go to kickstarter and there's a new campaign going so my secret for any rpg designers who are intimidated by reddit like me is just like post in unrelated reddits with your games in the background and if it does well enough people will start to sleuth okay but if you go into like r slash rpg uh you never know what you're gonna get i spent some time in there we've had some rough experiences i've had some okay experiences i um i have tried to like just take the i can't let it bother me if if people get rough on there because it's reddit that's just what's gonna happen I I've just I've just got to have a mental like barrier for when that happens. Yeah, it's like somebody invites you to backyard wrestling and you're like, OK, you got to understand that someone might throw a chair. At you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then and like I've tried to just sort of have conversation about like so with broken coming out. Right. So like my mentality for that is like have conversations about romance games and they aren't going to be all mine. Like they're probably not going to be mine at all. Cause I don't, mine's not even out yet. So like, just like, what are your favorite romance CTRPGs and just yeah. spin up conversation about that. And like, if at some point it does come out in some of the like follow up chat, like that I have a game coming out fine. If it doesn't, it doesn't, but that kind of inspired me to create the romance TTRPG subreddit because there's so many games. I keep seeing new romance related or either romance TTRPGs or romance adjacent TTRPGs. And I thought, oh, well, we can create a subreddit just for talking about them. Because if people like me are really into that genre of TTRPGs, like it can have its own subreddit. No yeah. one's there yet with me talking about it. There's a couple of people that have joined. I don't think anyone besides me has posted in it. My hope is that it'll, as people are releasing games, maybe they'll go there to post about it. And then like, um, it's also part of my, just like, it'll give me a place maybe to talk about broken. Yeah. You know, I'm a it. fan of like, I don't know. I like using platforms for unintended purposes too. Like, I think there's something very useful about a one member Reddit, you know, that is just kind of like, okay, this is a really nice, convenient ranked list, you know, um, the same way that like, I've been flirting with starting a possible worlds discord for a while, not necessarily to invite anyone to, but just to have like a journal for myself that I can put different channels in and I can record like my daily tasks and the projects I'm working yeah. on. And if I decide to invite people to it later, they'll yeah. be able to see like, Oh, this is what Tyler's been up to for the last year. Absolutely. Um, but you know, it's also just kind of nice to be like, all right, this wasn't the intended purpose, but this is something that I can seed for myself. And if it ever becomes practical to share, like to, you know, mobilize it for this purpose or that purpose, then it's there. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. We use discord a little bit kind of like that for some things, but uh, it's really interesting because I, one of the discords that I've been really excited about because this game, I don't know if you know the game uh, Manish Tana. Why is this night different? It's a Passover uh, TTRPG that got kickstarted like last month or the month before. And I we, definitely saw it floating around, yeah. but I don't know much about it. Yeah, so it's a great game, and you can you know anybody can look it up. But the, the cool thing is, I'm on the pretty relatively new. Uh, Discord for that, and I'm friends with the designers. Um, and Gabrielle and Ben, who are the designers, they were on this show, and we played a game of that game on this show. Um, but one of the cool things is that, like, the, it's mostly the people working on the game and on the like stretch goals for the game and all that in that Discord. So, like, I'm hanging out in that Discord watching them like make the game, like, talk yeah. about the game, like, making the game as it's happening. It's just such a cool space to be hanging out in because it's like. I get to see behind the curtain a little bit, but anybody that back the game can also join the discord. I think, I think, yeah, I, I think it's open, but it's cool to like see them working all, all, like on that discord server. Yeah. I'm, I really have a lot of it, admiration for designers that hold like office hours, mm -hmm. you know, where just anyone can come and like talk about games. And it's something that I've, you know, thought about doing but also you know then like the self-doubt comes in is yeah. like am i really interesting enough like am i going to have a more efficient brainstorming session if i am doing it publicly and there's no one in the audience and yeah. then like who am i talking to suddenly like i'm wasting my mm. brainstorming time yeah um but i did just get a little capture dealy 
Ooh. for HDMI to USB-C. Okay. So I'm hopefully going to be just like, as I do my uh, degreening process of uh, taking my brain out of the green zone, which is Kickstarter, and just like play Final Fantasy IX for the probably 30th time, <laughs> I can be like, okay, if people want to join me and like ask me questions... I can play this game on autopilot. I will ask, I will answer your questions about your games. I'll also just shoot the shit with you. Yeah. But if no one shows up, I'm still accomplishing a purpose by yeah. just like playing my game about theater thieves who become friends, um, yeah. which was also the inspiration for scene thieves. Like scene thieves is very transparently just my love letter to the first sequence in yeah. Final Fantasy IX. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I love I love the whole ethos of possible world games. I love like you mentioned your brother, right? Like mm -hmm. I if if people go to the website, you have a fabulous website, possibleworldgames.com. If you go there, you can I what I love about your website, your ethos, your business model, your marketing, like the way you do it on your website, I think it's really smart because like your description of like I'm just, I'm just looking at it right now. So it says when I write role playing games, I don't design them for gamers. Gamers, I design them for farmers. And then boom, you ha you talk about your brother and how he doesn't know anything about games, and it's so compelling. It, it's a good story, right? Like it's a good like it latches you on because it's a story, which people yeah. watch on the stories for marketing. But then like it also tells you everything about your ethos of the kinds of games you release, all in that story. So like it's just so well done, and I just love like. And and that really is what you do. Like you don't go outside of that. Like you, you you know. And I just think that's so smart because it's like you know what kind of games you make, and everybody else does too, right? Like and and that to me is like very clean and like really easy to to share and to explain um, and to understand. Um, and plus, it's also kind of unique. Like not that other people aren't releasing smaller or thirty-page type games. They are, but. I don't know. It's just something unique about the model that you have. Yeah, there's also something that like a lot of the plays that I've worked on because they are in this weird, impossible theater genre. Uh, I would oftentimes have bookstores that were shelving them be like, OK, should we put it in plays or in poetry? Mm. And we're like, all right, well, I would just be like, well, which section is bigger? Yeah. You know, um, like what is your like, you know, your customers best. What are they looking for? Um, and I think that also some of the time it really is uh, an author's choice. Mm. Like if an author is very explicit about like, this is a play, I'm submitting it to a play press. Um, it is not poetry. Then yeah, I think it should be shelved with the plays. So there's something nice about the fact that like so many lyric games could be poems. They mm. could be submitted to poetry journals. They could be flash fiction. Mm. So many like memoir games don't necessarily have to be memoir games. Mm. They could just be a memoir yeah. written in an experimental form. But I think there is something simultaneously powerful about, you know, being able to take something and say, like, this is the genre it is, and I am saying it is this genre to, uh, like, help tee up your experience with this text, mm. uh, how you are going to digest it. But I think there's also something powerful about texts that are in those, you know, like in those in-between zones uh, and that can occupy multiple spaces. Because I definitely am designing tabletop role-playing games mm -hmm. and I refer to them as such. Um, but, you know, I would not be offended if someone put my games, you know, closer to apples to apples than to Dungeons and Dragons, mm -hmm. you know, because I am trying to create play experiences that are very much like the group of friends or family around a table being like, what are we going to do to kill for the next hour yeah. until, you know, like the trains start to go home mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the game that is, you know, caught up in all of the D and D trappings of like, this is a capital E experience mm. that you have to be capital P prepared for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I kind of been thinking about that a lot with some of our stuff that we've been doing too, for the, like, like we, we just finished doing the hard lessons and that's a game where I didn't, I don't think we ever used the term role-playing game for it because I just don't know that it's the right, I think we use storytelling. I think we said storytelling and world building game. I haven't exactly found the best expression for that, but like, to me, that sounds more accurate to what it is than just saying role playing game. And I think it's what you just talked about. Like, it's not that big E experience, 
right? Yeah. It's like, okay, we can do this, like, with friends at a park. Like, if I can invite my parents over and sit down and play it with them. Yeah. You know, like, and just boom, here, hey, we're going to play this game. Here it is. Um, that's kind of what that is, right? It's not. Yeah. And, and yeah, I don't know that there's. It is a role playing game. <laughs> it is a tabletop yeah. role playing game, but it's also like not in a certain way that it's really hard to distinguish exactly what the difference is or what makes it. It's unique. a big part of my job as a dramaturg was like litigating words, you know, of being like, is this word more specific than this word, mm. or is this word going to be more accessible to an audience uh, than this word? And sometimes the answer is no, and that is intentional, you know. Mm. Uh, because if you say to like uh, a playwright, like, well, not everyone's going to understand th what this word is like a perfectly fine example is like, OK, they can look it up when they get home. Like, it is important for me to use this word. A lot of times my edits would be like, hey, I'm flagging this, you know, like, is this a concern? And if they said no, I'm like, cool, if you're not worried about it, I'm not worried about it. If they say like, oh, that wasn't something that I really care about, that was just kind of like what hit the page and be like, oh, okay, well then my note would be, this might be a better word choice for these reasons. And some at some point it is just kind of like, you know, a bit of just a thought exercise, but sometimes it is meaningful to think in terms of like, what assumptions are you making about your audiences? What vocabularies do they have? Yeah. Uh, so you were talking about my website. Um, one of the big things I did on my website is if you go to the games page and you scroll down through the links and it's like, okay, like, I, I can't remember if I say print or physical or what um, for like the actual bound books, but for a while I had like, okay, you can buy it in print or you can buy it digital, you know, and a lot of people, they're coming to a games website and they see buy digital and they're just like, oh, okay, well, do I, is it going to take me to Steam? You know, oh, like, do I do I need an executable here? Which is why I use the term ebook, mm. which is something that isn't really thrown around in RPG spaces. Like, no one's talking about the new ebook they put on itch.io. But if you think in terms of like the audience that is like, oh, I heard this was like a fun party game, and that all you need is the instruction manual. Sometimes saying to like the mom who is pre prepping a family get together, like here's where you get the ebook, it's $5 less. Yeah. You know, that makes a lot more sense than being like, you can get a wire bound notebook or you can buy it in digital format in a dot PDF. I might steal this. I'm going to steal this. If you, if I, I'm going to, no, please. I'm going to steal this because I'll I did you, not invent ebooks. E I'll tell you why I'm going to steal this. I was literally trying to explain itch funding broken to my uncle yesterday. Yeah. And this is a person with no TTRPG knowledge. At all. I had almost had to explain what an RPG is. Like I had to explain this person had no knowledge going into it, right? And to exp and and trying to explain like it's a digital PDF version of the book that we're funding. Yeah. If I had just said it's an ebook. Yeah. You can put it on your Kindle. Exactly. It would have. He would have understood. He had those tools. He had that language, but he didn't have the language I was using. So that's pretty smart. I don't know why we're not using that more. <laughs> Well, my partner works in like capital A accessibility, okay. um, works in services for the disabled community here in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a lot of like, and there are plenty of big accessibility things that designers can be doing for their games. Um, you know, creating like .txt versions of their text that are like pretty bare bones acceptable for like text-to-speech readers and things like that. A lot yeah. of different things from like font choices down the line. Mm -hmm. um, even something like my game Hounds uh, has a dexterity mechanic where you stack dice um, and when the tower falls, something happens. But uh, I made sure that I included a variation on the rules that does not require stacking dice uh, for the people who like, you know, if you have like shaky hands, yeah. you know, there's no reason why this game should be worse for you. Yeah. Um, so there are also lower case A accessibility things you can do for your games, though, that sometimes are just word choice, mm -hmm. you know, that are just kind of defaulting to the word that, you know, like the least of us will understand, like the least educated, least entrenched in the hobby person will be able to roll with that versus the word that signals to everyone that you are aware of the lineage you're part of. Um, and 
sometimes, like depending on the spaces you're in, depending on the kind of game you're writing, you want to signal to folks like, hey, I am part of the timeline and I want you to be thinking about that timeline as you play this game. Yeah. But if your goal is to get people who are maybe playing a game for the first time, yeah. uh, then you should assume that they know what stories are and they know what fun is, but they might not know all like the weird nomenclature you've assigned to it. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. This is great. I don't want to cut this great conversation off, but it is. No, a that's cost. it's great. You don't have to because I'm staying. Yes, exactly. We're gonna put a pin in it, and we're gonna bring Nevin on the show. So I'm gonna uh, everyone stick around for just a minute. We're gonna put up a be right back slide. We're gonna bring uh, Nevin on the show, and we're gonna keep the good conversation going. So thanks everybody. Don't go anywhere. As soon as I find my my be right back slide. Okay, we will be back in just a couple minutes. Uh, stay tuned.
Maybe we should not say them at the same time. Or maybe oh. we should. Hi, Nevin. Hi, it's so Tyler. nice to have you on my show that I've hosted for I'm, such a I'm long time. I'm happy to be here. I'm yeah. so glad that you invited me uh, along to your show. That yeah. You've been running for decades. Yeah. There's built, not a single I, show that's anything like it. And I'm so I glad. I built to be this here. house brick by brick with my own two hands. <laughs> you built the bricks too. Something a lot of people don't know. You actually made these bricks. <laughs> yeah. And not out of, you know, like typical brick materials. I made them out of like smaller bricks. And um, books. Yeah, and, and I just like the mortar, mortared those together. Yeah, the mortar. The mortar is made from book pulp. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. The, when when they uh, recycle paper, they're turning it into uh, bricks. I don't know. Hey Ben. Hey, we're to all show. here. We're all here, and yeah. everyone can hear all of us now. I apologize, audience, for that. I uh, <laughs> I told Nevin and Tyler that I I. I forgot to, I checked the, made sure our camera is in the right place, our name tags are in the right place, but of course I forgot to make sure the audio was working, and there's always one of those things. With We're streams. doing new things here. Yeah. We're experimenting. Exactly. This is zany. It's yeah. zany. Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> wild and kooky. <laughs> Nevin, welcome to Holy Happy Hour, Batman. Hello, I'm happy to be here on Holy Happy Hour, Batman. Thanks for making the time to come on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I I'm think glad you, we could do something so cool. Yeah, I'm glad it worked out. It was so funny to for the audience's sake who doesn't know this. Like, It was like I was trying to fit Tyler on the show during the Kickstarter. I really wanted to. Plus, I'd wanted Tyler on the show forever and just didn't work out at, at any point before this. And then I had planned to have Nevin on the show. Actually, I think it was Spencer Campbell that recommended to have you on the show. Uh, Nevin, yeah. I think Spencer was like, you got to get my friend Nevin on the show. Um, Spencer's a good egg. Spence is cool. Like we were talking before about people who are really interesting to watch, like design and, uh, you know, do like design stuff, Tyler. Like, Spencer's yeah, like someone, office yeah. hour type things. Yeah. Yeah. Spencer's yeah. like, like watching Spencer playtest Rune on stream has been way more riveting than watching someone play a solo, solo RPG should be. Yeah. Like, it's super. It's anyway. Uh, so it, it turned out that you two knew each other. And yeah. Then, I have yeah. Uh, edited some of Nevin's games. And then also Nevin and I have been in designer circles together and like mm -hmm. have had the pleasure of, you know, gassing each other's games up for a while. Truly. So when, uh, when we were talking about, you know, like, Hey, is there any way to get me on during claw Atlas? And you were like, well, you could do maybe an early show and then I have a late show. I was like, oh, well, I could just stick around. You know, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, and you're like, oh, well, let me talk to the other designer. It's Nevin Holmes. I was like, oh, they are a good friend of mine. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, this will be can fine. You, I am perfectly you, content to just like stick around as your Andy Richter <laughs> and like, you know, help can send you, up Nevin. Yeah. Like, can you imagine if I had just been like, ugh, no. What? No. <laughs> Gross. Yeah, but it's I, funny. I, I talked to him on uh, Discord yesterday. Yeah. I don't want him to be on my talk why show. Would I, why would I ever? <laughs> no, it's so cool that the two of you happen to be good friends. I was like, I, well, okay, that's a fun coincidence, and let's freaking do it. Let's 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 make a special episode happen. Awesome. Yeah. So was, I, yeah. the thing that I hadn't heard, though, is like, what were you originally planning on talking to Nevin about before I crash this party like what, because what, i also just love hearing about nevin's games it wasn't like i don't think there was anything in particular sometimes i just have you know designers on just to talk about their work and design philosophy and all that i i so we can kind of talk about your sort of games and like what you do nevin in any uh, sort of cutting in any direction i will say i particularly have an interest in i want to hear what games you have worked on together but of all your games, the one that speaks to my soul is Gun and Sl Slinger because I'm a huge yep. Dark Tower fan. I'm a big, you know, big fan of that of that genre, and I love that's about, you know, the person and the weapon together. So I, I would love to talk a little bit about that game, but uh, I also do want to talk about whatever games the two of you have worked on together. I know um, what's it called, Kitchen Nightmares, right? Yes, Kitchen I, Nightmares. I edited Kitchen Nightmares, and yep. then the other big one was um, uh, as of yet unreleased game. <laughs> as as of yet Ooh. unreleased. Um, yeah. So first, real quick, yeah. can I just like tell everybody at home who the hell I am? Yeah, absolutely. Do it. <laughs> you we can tell everybody at Nevin Holmes. Oh my gosh. I'll never get tired of it. <laughs> um, yeah, we just kind of like jumped right into it. So I just want to take a moment real yeah, quick. Please. Um, 
Hi, I'm Nevin Holmes. I use they, he pronouns. Um, if you know me, you can use any pronouns. doesn't matter. Um, I am a queer tabletop role-playing game designer based out of Central Texas. Uh, I am best known at this point for my work on Gun and Slinger, uh, but I have also designed a glut of other games, uh, and I work with my... Um, my wife and my co-designer uh, and the incredible artist who lives under my house, uh, Julianne Munoz, or Jam, as everyone knows her. Um, we are a uh, self-described powerhouse team that just designs a lot of really kick-ass games. Tyler can confirm this. Yeah, I would um, I would describe that to you. You don't have to help self anymore. Oh, but I'm going to self, you know, yeah. if, I, if I don't self, then. Um, we make a lot of really cool stuff. We, we focus on designing really, like, I mean, we make games inspired by the things we love. Uh, we make things inspired by the things we love because it's not just games. Sure. And we really push ourselves to create new, interesting things for everyone. Um, in most cases for everyone, in some cases for very specific people. <laughs> um, I've designed Gun and Slinger, Kitchen Nightmares that Tyler's worked on, uh, You're in Space and Everything's Fucked, which is my love letter to sci-fi horror uh, that Tyler also edited on. Yeah, um, big dead space energy, alien yeah. energy, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's killer. Um, not yet released, uh, but we also just crowdfunded Just a Car, a courtroom drama for four to six players. Yeah. I have a player count on it now, Tyler. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> um that is a game inspired by Phoenix Wright, my cousin Vinny, legally blonde, like courtroom drama stuff. Love it. Where players um, sit at a table together and create a crime web and then play out the courtroom proceedings uh, of that crime web and figure out what really happened. It's awesome. It's um, so cool. Just a Car that, is my favorite kind of um, like being privy to game design uh, with other designers because most of Nevin, my relationship on that game is Nevin will say like, hey, I just came up with some really cool shit and send yeah. me like a paragraph. I'm like, yeah, no, you're right. That is some really cool shit. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. <laughs> and then like a month later, I'll be like, oh, and here's how like surprise witnesses work. I'm like, yes. yeah, no. Finally. Con continues to be very cool shit. <laughs> Tyler, Tyler has, has truly been along for every step of the ride. Of, I don't know how to do this to I figured it out and it rules. Yeah. Um, right now, we're working on launching a new website. Uh, you can find the current website at dinoberrygf.com. You can find uh, me at Fork20 on Twitter, and you can find Jam at DinoBerryJam on Twitter. That's all my stuff. Now we, now we can talk about yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. No, I love the, like, peek behind the curtain of the uh, that people don't get to see of, like, the, uh, hey, check out this cool shit that... I wrote and then just like, oh yeah, that's really cool shit. Like I love that kind of peek behind the curtain that that's like what happens between different designers. Yeah, a lot people of people about. don't think about how a lot of creativity does not happen in a vacuum. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, the same way that like writers will have writing groups where they workshop their poems or share like short stories or things like that. A lot of the game designers that you like follow and enjoy are also talking to each other yeah. and like need just as much like support and cheerleading as anyone else you know because it is like especially when you're writing collaborative games these are a lot of people that like are in it because they enjoy collaboration yeah yeah Absolutely yeah true. so do you I, i'm curious how you treat this because like like if you say say you're like talking sort of talking at another designer about and you're kind of brainstorming and that person's like oh well what if you did it this way or whatever and they like you know you're kind of like talking at each other about it and like uh, workshopping it a little bit <sighs> crediting that work crediting that brainstorming i'm curious about that um if that ends up making it into is it the kind of thing that makes it into design credits like because for broken i gave i, I did some of that with blaine martin who's been my best friend for 20 years and it does some work in teach rpgs is published um and like honestly, some of my early design for Broken, we kind of talked at each other about it. And he was like, "Well, what if you did this?" So I felt like when I started getting ready to publish a game, I needed to give him a design credit. So I put like additional design <laughs> by Blaine Martin. But I'm curious, how do you credit the people you kind of brainstorm with, or maybe you don't need to? Maybe that doesn't. I think it very much depends on the relationship that you have with the person and how you approach talking about things together. Because I, I have a lot of very close game designer friends. 
Yeah. Tyler, Spencer, uh, Vedicio Valetti, Kevin Wynn, uh, Keegan EXE. Like, yeah. I, these are people that I am talking to about my designs. Anytime I write a paragraph, as Tyler put it. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of like, okay, what kind of relationship do we have? What, how are we treating this specific conversation? Am I asking you for design feedback? If I am, then we'll figure out if you want or need to be credited, if I need to pay you for your work, stuff like that. Um, but I, I, I think personally with a lot of the people that I know, it's very much casual conversations and I take things into consideration. Um, unless I'm paying someone to do that for me or doing a work trade or something like that, then I'm probably not going to use the design whole cloth because that's yeah. just, the, the, the waters get muddier on that and it's a lot better for everyone if you're on the same page. I think it's also a good skill for any designer who is on the other side of the equation uh, to kind of like learn what is productive feedback, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, for sure. A lot of times the right note is not um, like, hey, you should change this. And it is, have you thought about this? Mm -hmm. And if their answer is, yes, I've thought about this. And I've also thought about why I'm not going to do that. Then like, that's fine. Or if their answer is like, no, I hadn't really thought about it. Like, I'll keep it in consideration. That's also fine. Um, but I, I think some of it's just the company you keep as far as like, okay, uh, like how integrated of a process is this? Um, how much an, an, of an ego does this person have? Like if I ask yeah. them to casually look at this thing, are they going to be expecting a credit? And is that like, you know, uh, a swamp I want to wade into? But also like anytime Nevin sends me something, it's not like there's a deadline, you yeah. know? It's not like Nevin can't continue their work uh, until I've gotten back to them. Like it is much less a like, oh my co-designer like please yeah. rubber stamp this good idea i had it is much just like like hey i've been working on this in a vacuum like jam has read it and but they're also my partner yeah you know as someone whose <laughs> opinion i trust like can you just like verify that this like works yeah Pl and, please put eyes on yeah. this and tell me it's not mud exactly yeah. unless i'm you going know. for mud and then it's yeah. tell me it's mud yeah the sequel to gerps mud modular <laughs> uh, uh modular unlimited design there you go. yes modular unlimited design i spencer if you're listing that one's mine <laughs> yeah <laughs> i i think that like the writer's room way of writing things even and designing games is how I personally function the best. It's also a hard environment to find for designing things unless you have like the ability to make the time to get together just with right. I think I think it design. I think an important thing about existing in this space is um, it kind of comes in two parts with regards to like having trouble finding that space. Uh, it's one uh, being willing to try and put that space together for yourself. Um, and two, understanding that everybody already has like 15 Discord servers. So you might just have to message them directly. Yeah. Um, the value behind like shared casual space where everyone is in it for like, okay, we're all queer designers hanging out in a space. We can talk about game design. We can talk about whatever. Um, you know, as long as we're all aware that like this is a part of what's going on here, then that's great. Um, that's really all it takes. And the, the trick is for it to be a, a chill thing. You, you don't yeah. want a bunch of people in a discord server with their ties all, all tight, barely able to speak because it's so tight just going, oh yes, uh, I'm posting this and I need feedback in 45 minutes. If you reply, yeah. I'll, I'll get you uh, $5. Yeah. Now I, I don't know like if i think we might have been in some discords together but mm -hmm. i don't think we were particularly tight when you're working on gun and slinger um mm -hmm. like what like how much of that was in a vacuum you know as far as like this first kind of like really the name that most people would associate with mm -hmm. you like has your design process changed since then as you've created additional games now that like you have more people interested in collaborating with you 
or was it also just kind of like a microcosm of how you design games now? Uh, it has changed a little bit. I don't think it's changed in any like extreme ways. Um, with Gun and Slinger, I was very much like just dipping my toes into the space. I think the only Discord I was in at the time was Brain Trust, mm -hmm. um, and I was starting to like force my way into spaces on Twitter uh, with a with a crowbar. Um, and the people that I was talking to at that time, I think were pretty much limited to like Spencer and Viditia Valetti. Um, I, I didn't really know anybody else. Um, but the process very much was, it was very similar of going like, okay, I've designed an aspect of this game. Let's see what these people that I know think. Um, also John Geary, um, fantastic yeah, designer, John's very great. cool dude. Um, the process is still pretty similar to that. I think now I have a better handle on how to structure things and maybe what, what to play closer to the chest or when to actually bug people with something mm -hmm. instead of just everything. Yeah. So there are still some people, Tyler, that I bug with everything. <laughs> um, and that's fine. Yeah. Like, it's also just like, <laughs> once you get to know someone yeah. well enough, you know if they are going to resent, you know, like exactly. a Google Doc. I, I, I learned who to not send stuff to, and I talk to them about different things now. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. I Re mean, relationships, like, relationships, especially in a creative field like this, need to have those kinds of boundaries. It's yeah, fine. it is Im as important uh, as like a creative in any field to um, know how and when to say yes, and also know mm. how and when to say no. Yeah, um, absolutely. Because yes. It's like, um, you know, uh, Ben and I have been talking recently about crowdfunding yeah. and yeah. just the, the hell that it is. Uh, and like getting ready for um, the torture that you, you are willingly going to put yourself through, uh, crowdfunding, itch funding another game. Um, and it's also something that like, I've talked with a number of designers about and the like the worst thing is not to fail to fund a Kickstarter. Uh, the worst thing is to fund a Kickstarter or any crowdfunding campaign at a dollar amount that is less than what you actually need to create that game in a way that doesn't burn you out and puts it out at the quality you want. Yeah, It's the same way with like mentorship opportunities or peer design, those kind of things. Like there's nothing wrong with saying no to people. There is nothing wrong with having conversations with someone up to a point where they're like, hey, actually, you know, like, would you like to be a co-designer on this? And to know yourself well enough to know that like, you know, hey, I'd love to be kept abreast of this, but I don't think I actually have, you yeah. know, the energy for that right now. Um, but it can be very bad if you just say yes to everyone. Yeah. And then you spread yourself so thin that you are not being the kind of peer, uh, the kind of sounding board that they want or that you want to be. Uh, so there have been plenty of times where I have said, like, yes to people, you know, like, let's, like, I'm happy to do this, that, or the other thing. And there have also been times where people have asked me for, you know, advice on something, and I've said, like, cool, I don't have the time or energy to write an email addressing all of the questions I think you might need answers for. So if you send me, like, 10 specific questions, I will answer them. You know, or like, hey, I have a half hour. I will talk to you on the phone for a half hour and I will talk much faster than I type mm -hmm. because I know that like, you know, the best use of both of our time is just like being efficient and realistic about what we have to offer. Yeah. Well, so kind of along those lines, like with like talking about that workflow, like it must be very different living with a person that you make stuff with. And I'm just curious, like what that looks like for you and Jam and like whether, like what's that energy like? Cause it must be much different. Maybe it's similar to like the p paragraphs you're sending to Tyler, but like, you yeah, know, it's- Bold it's... of you to assume that Nevin and I also don't work together. Um... <laughs> Fair, <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> so answer um... this however you like then. <laughs> um, so it, it kind of is similar. It, it depends on the project. Um, yeah. Recently, we've with with our work to like launch this 
true like collaborative business effort with yeah. Dino Berry Press, we have been refining how we handle working on these things. Yeah. Um, as an example, you know, we it, it used to very much be like, here's this doc, or can you read this doc? And now it's like, okay, we are both actively kind of living in a doc. One of the projects that we're working on, this is a great example, uh, is called Warriors, the Cats of Cyberspace. Um, I have been just like drooling over the pictures <laughs> Jam has been posting of this. It's They're so, so good. good. This is a, uh, it's, it's a Warrior Cats inspired uh, Lumen game set in cyberspace. Um, but Lumen that, being Spencer, one of Spencer Spencer's, systems. one of Spencer's yeah. systems, yes. Um, but that very much has been like, okay, we have this doc and we are living in it. We have built it from the ground up. We've worked on using tools like Notion to keep our thoughts organized. Uh, we keep each other updated with like, this is what I'm going to work on today. Um, or, you know, I left eight comments in our reference doc. Can you go look at them within the next couple of days and get back to me? Um, and it, it's very much, I, I think the trick really is figuring out how to effectively balance your <laughs> work-life balance has a different meaning, I guess. Um, especially when you're trying to like really make a go of it. Mm -hmm. So it's about, and especially when to... you're trying to like actually live a life as a couple. Yeah. You know, yes. that is more than just like Absolutely. cohabitating. That's what I was like. Ask. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We've, like, I think right now with what we've been doing with Warriors, it's very much like, okay, I've written these three paragraphs. Can you look at them in your own time? Or I left 10 comments. Can you just go and reply to them? Instead of having to sit together and look through everything at the same time, because we both have very different schedules. Sure. Um, it's, it's figuring out how to do it on your own time. Yeah. Um, that said, we have like just this last weekend, we started trying to do uh, a dedicated co-working time where, you know, we make breakfast and then we sit down at the table together and we just work on stuff, whether that's talking about the business or like triaging and prioritizing things we need to do uh, or actually just having completely Performing different... an actual triage, open heart yes. surgery. <laughs> exactly. Um, or whether it's just having two completely different Google Docs open and working on our own things and asking each other a question sometimes. Yeah. Um, it's definitely different to not living with someone who you're working on game design with, for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, so I'm going to ask this question, but if, but you can X card it if you'd like. Uh, but I am just curious, like, how it's been as far as, like, being in a relationship with someone that you're working with all the time. Like, how is that affecting, like, the relationship half of that life-work balance? Um, so I'm just going to say, like, I, there's no way to say this without sounding incredibly cheesy. Okay. Um, uh, we can be cheesy. <laughs> I, I can, uh, I can, we hate each other. <laughs> I, I can think of no single person in the universe that would be a better match. Um, we have so many of the same ideas and so many of the creative of the same like creative drives and and points of passion about this and so many of the same thoughts about this that it's fine. <laughs> it's it's great. Yeah. Um, the number of times where we'll just be like on a road trip or or thinking about something completely different and one of us will go oh hey i had this idea and then we decide that we're gonna make it um it's been great <laughs> that's awesome we, uh, when i when i tell people that we're a powerhouse couple i mean it so i mean i i agree like it has been really impressive to to see how the two of them have synergized like further and further you know, in terms of like, you know, a period where like both of them are working on their own projects and kind of having them in like entirely separate portals on the internet. Um, like Nevin, your Skell IT tons is your game, right? Yeah, skeletons. Yeah. Well, with like IT <laughs> workers. Skell um, dash IT dash ums. Yeah. A, and yeah. um yeah, that was, that was a game, game. Yeah, that you commissioned 
uh, an artist for. I, I forget their name. Is it Jack something? Uh, um, Jack McGee. Yeah. And um, so yeah. it has the... been really interesting seeing like how it's like, okay, this is a Nevin style game, you know, with uh, a Jack coat of paint on it. Mm -hmm. um, and also seeing like, okay, these are Dino Berry Jam products, mm. you know, that are like oftentimes uh, hobby like or nerd influencer adjacent. Um, and then to see like the peanut butter and chocolate of it come together where it's like, yeah, no, like these are two things that complement each other while also being like fully representative of both individuals is really nice. It's great. Thank you so much. Tyler. I don't. I also I'm don't blushing. want to discount my own partner though, who texts me things <laughs> like, "We should make a game for cats." <laughs> I'm like, "Oh, no!" Which legitimately I think yes, is a fantastic idea. Please. Like, I was like, "Oh, go on," and she's you like, "Yeah, literally a tabletop role playing game that your cat plays." Like, I want cats to be batting around dice, and it means things. Wasn't and... there a um? Wasn't there a game jam a couple years back that was like games for your cat? Oh, um, I really hope so. Or something like that. There was something. It does ring a bell. But somebody it's... made like an Oracle game based on how your cat reacts to you when you go up to pet them. <sighs> that is so good. It's <laughs> so good. <laughs> so um, good. As, especially because both of our cats are very different. So now I just want to play this game. Um, well, but the, yeah, yeah, it is always really exciting when not only do you have a partner that can engage in your hobby with you? Um, but also like, I would be completely fine with my partner just being like, Hey, this is a cool thing that you enjoy in your zone. And I will be supportive of you and retweet your Kickstarter. But it's also just like, I don't know. It makes me feel really warm when I do get the casual text that is just like, we should make a game for our cats and we should play it together with our cats. Yeah. It's just like, yes, that's what I want. This is this is the life Absolutely. I've been dreaming of. Yeah. There's 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 definitely something I mean it's <laughs> warm is a fantastic way to put it. Um magical is another far cheesier way to put it. Mm -hmm. Um and that's not to say that like there aren't projects that like don't work out. Sure. Um like we we've, we've had a couple of projects that we've we've tried to design that you know after a point we had to sit back and be like this game is not working and it's frustrating so we're going to just shelve it and maybe never think about it again yeah um, and it's also not to discount that like you know <laughs> we're designers to aspire to because we have partners that are cool um you know like there's also like it's completely valid also to have like yeah design partnerships you know mm -hmm. yeah like if nevin and i were on the same page for years and then like our design sensibilities our schedules our time zones went in different directions and we couldn't have like the same kind of casual back and forth like if i was on an nda or something like that mm -hmm. you know it is appropriate to mourn you know working relationships that change the same way that it is appropriate to mourn uh, romantic relationships that change yeah. or partnerships Absolutely. that change mm -hmm. yes. and learn from those things right. and maybe avoid repeating them. But it doesn't change the fact that like, you know, I am never going to regret sending Nevin a message that says, what if just a car was uh, spaced out? So it's just a car. <laughs> do, you, do you want to know how many people have said this to me? Really? Um, I, I hope all of them. I hope that it is I've, like I've the number one SEO um, for your game. Somebody somebody actually suggested that I make a add-on for Torque. Uh, Will Yopes. Yeah, 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 that was me. Torque. I did that. Yeah, you did that. <laughs> you little I'm, gremlin. I'm smart and funny. <laughs> <laughs> um. I also want to say, and, and, and this is like a really important, I think we all need to recognize that it's very important to know that it's completely valid to have a partner that's not cool. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. it's also completely valid to have a partner who is way cooler than you. Yeah. And because they're way cooler than you, they do not play tabletop role playing games. Exactly. And you don't <laughs> yeah, have anything you, to do with your hobby. Do you, do you know anybody who's that cool? Because I don't. I don't think they exist. Mm. I mean, um, it's like the the John Waters quote um, that is like lobbied around a lot. It's like, oh, you know, if someone if you go home someone with someone and they don't have books, like don't have sex with them. Right. Um, it's like 
I don't know. Sounds like a normal person to me. <laughs> like not a lot of people like decorate with books the way that I do. Like my brain just yeah, happens gotta... to be like poisoned in some really specific ways. Yeah, There's I've got books a, um, everywhere. I don't want to show you on my shelf. It's embarrassing. Mine are blank right now because I'm moving. So everything is in box. Actually, earlier I was going to pull. I was like, oh, I can be really cool and pull my possible, impossible, like, uh, you know, collection, heart, you know, uh, box set out and hold it up for the audience. And then I realized it's sealed in a box over here. Next no. To me. Yeah. So I can't because I'm, I'm moving. I can actually. I have some books on my desk that I can show you that are very cool. Uh, please yeah. Do. That is another really nice thing about um, Dino Berry Jam is that. In addition to learning how to be design partners, they've also been learning how to make a lot of their stuff in house. That's awesome. Yeah. Right so right. we are we we've got a printer, we've got binding tools, we've got presses, um, and there is a lot of stuff that we are actually working on making entirely from the ground up. Goodness, I love um, this. Nevin fact, did not mention that part of the uh, like Warrior Cats in Space game is Jam has been like splicing together. Yeah. She did little cat action figures what? with like laser guns. I bought, I bought a bunch of little um <laughs> little cat. She told me she wanted to do this. I was like, these are cheap. Let's do it. Uh, she told me that she wanted to like kit bash a lot of minis. Um, and there are, you can you can buy a bag of like twenty five plastic cat figurines for like $8. you can buy a bag of cats and no one you will can stop. Buy a bag of they cats. can't do anything. To you. <laughs> you can buy a bag of cats and they won't. No stop one you. will do anything. Um, there's nothing in the Constitution about cats. <laughs> <laughs> so I bought cats. I bought like twenty five, fifty cats. Uh, and she's been kid bashing and painting them, and they're really killer. I don't have one in here. Um, well, they just have to trust me. They're very they have cool. guns. Um, but I, what we have been making that I have with me are some some books, some zines. Um, this is Sprouts, um, which is Jam's game of using sticky notes to adventure around your house, um, designed for people of all ages. Nice. And this is like fu fully produced, laid out, printed, bound, everything here. Oh, that's awesome. Um, we've got uh, oh, this. I don't know if I can show this one. It's not announced yet. Oh, you can um, break it right here on my show. This is Buttonhead. I have heard you talk about this. People, it's been announced. People just don't realize that your Twitter jokes are not just jokes. Yeah, my Twitter jokes aren't just jokes. This is Jam's hack of Gun and Slinger. Okay. He plays the two halves of a centaur. Um, and this is one of the you're in space and everything's fucked books, nice which uh this is a screen printed cover um it's, oh, wow it's so sweet that's awesome that one's gonna end up being spiral bound um we also have what waits beneath which is like stitch bound hand stitch bound here at home wow um it's awesome to yeah. be able to do these things and i'm gonna be honest more people should do them because they're they're time consuming and they're challenging and sometimes they can be expensive, but they're incredibly rewarding. Mm. Yeah. It's also like all of these are transferable skills, you know, mm -hmm. like what you learn in like binding a book for your like gaming hobby will also be applicable to when like you have a fairly family heirloom photo album that like you know how to fix because you've done this stuff yeah or you know you just need to like help a friend like print up flyers for a political you know rally or like make menus for a pop-up or something like yeah. that like these it's are all just fun. like good like it's it's fun to learn crafts like yes. there's a reason why they like keep existing yeah people people can't get enough of these crafts actually i wanted to bring up too um y'all were talking about romance games yeah earlier um jam has actually designed a romance game too and i wanted to add that to your list oh, yes please yes. do um yes. it's uh called motel spooky nine okay. uh, it's itch it's itch funding right now really um, this yeah, has not been on my radar at all. See, I tried really hard to catch like anything There's... romance related in in. Ben, Mary's... it's fine. It's really scary. It's just really scary. It's, it's so spooky. very spooky. Um, I like spooky. I'm go cool with spooky. This this game rules. Okay. Um, I've played it a few times. It's truly fantastic. But it's you. Uh, it's a solo journaling game, like okay. an oracle game. 
um, where you are exploring a paranormal romance hotel. Okay. Um, you don't have to have romance in it. You don't have to do anything 18 plus in it. Um, Unless. It's, it's a, it is a game about making connections uh, and, and meeting people and learning about this character that you're embodying and maybe sometimes yourself. Um, it's truly kick-ass and not enough people are screaming about it. Yeah, but well, it is, I, a, I would... it is a romance game for your list. What is it called again? Motel, Motel Spooky Night. Motel, Mo- Motel or Hotel? Motel. Motel. Holiday Inn? M- Motel. Uh, if you go to bytes.rip slash ms9, it'll take you there. B-Y-T-E-S. Uh, hold on. You're going to repeat that for me? Bytes? Dot rip, R-I-P, uh-huh. slash ms9. It didn't work. Uh, maybe That's I typed... bytes with a Y. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting this in real time as I'm like, oh, I kind of realized as you were saying it that it was the wrong bites. I got it now. Yeah, it's the cool bites. I it's see. the cool bites. So, so I'm going to definitely a... blast this out to people because I'm super excited. About Excellent. This. Uh, I, I, I love it. And also, so here's the thing. It's a solo game. I was going to say the vibe of it is so my me and my um, spouse did a do a podcast together called pot of love it's on hiatus right now but our second season of the show which is most of our episodes is a romance it's like several connected romance games that tell the story of a small town but it's a haunted town it's a town where falling in love with someone might mean that you get possessed by a ghost um of somebody trying to be reunited with their true love who they never reunited with who they weren't able to get with like and so it's very ghost romance is our whole vibe of season two of that show um and this is like yeah. well the this, great thing mm-hmm. about any solo rpg yeah. is that you can actually play it with as many people as you want you just have to ask True. them what do you think yeah you know that's a good point that yeah. i actually don't know if i've ever thought about that but that's a yeah really it's good just point. like that's, game that's design and action <laughs> listen I, I i tell people that that space fucked is a gm and one player but really you don't have to listen to me yeah all I did was write the book. Do whatever you want. I don't care. Yeah. The artwork uh, on this too is so on Motel so Spooky good. Night is so awesome. It's so good. Um, more people need to be raving about this. True. I hang out on TTRPG <laughs> Twitter a lot, and it was not on my radar. It's it's funny how like yeah the the space has really ballooned. Yeah. in a way that things can fly under your radar and sometimes yeah. that can be sometimes that can be like very discouraging you know um and sometimes that can be i don't know there's sometimes there's something kind of beautiful about that like i worked in niche literature for years before i got into rpgs and i would always i would have authors who would get really bummed about their book not selling as well as appears or not getting like reviews in big publications or things like that or not getting like the big tweet numbers um but the more niche you get in the kind of work you're creating the more specific you're getting like not to say that it wouldn't benefit from a large audience and that like a general audience couldn't find a lot of special things in it. But really as a creative, your only obligation is to put enough pings out into the universe um, that the people who are looking specifically for the thing you're doing, that it can find them. Yeah. You know, that if someone is searching the right search terms, like you will be at the end of that line. So much of the kind of like passive discovery stuff is out of your control. Um, but the one thing that you can be in control of is being clear about what you're about and making sure that people know that. Mm. Um, and it is like, it's also funny how careers can be in different stages, you know, um, like I've kind of been like, this Kickstarter has been a weird one for me because first off it the average tier for my last kickstarter was 50 dollars. the average tier for this one is 12 dollars. and so like day one you know funds start coming in and i have like an like a super anxious moment because it's raising funds slower than my last kickstarter even though more people are backing it um 
And so eventually I got, I was like, okay, I need to watch the number of backers. I need yeah. to not watch the dollar amount. I need to watch the number of backers. Yeah. But then also like, this is my third Kickstarter. I'm kind of a known quantity at this point. Yeah. I funded after 48 hours. Yeah. And while all of those are great things, it means that like, I'm not as desperate. And so the friends and family that were coming out of the woodwork for previous campaigns to like check in and be like, Tyler, how are you doing? This seems like a, a hellish ordeal that you put yourself through. <laughs> um, or people saying like, hey, is there any way that like I can give you like a bump mid campaign? A lot of that stuff, you know, still has been happening, but not in like the same kind of frequency because I'm now at a point in my career where I'm grateful that people can look at me and say like, Tyler's doing fine. Uh, but it's also like, there's part of me that is mourning like mm. the scrappy indie of yesteryear. And so it is really interesting, I think, too, as you like watch people's careers and things like that, and you kind of see like, okay, this is their Kickstarter phase. This is their itch funding phase. This is their like bespoke game phase. You know, I do like, I'm excited to see whatever kind of choices people make to experiment and get closer to the model that works for them. Mm -hmm. But also like, I get really excited about the thing that just happened where, you know, a game could be up for a while. And that doesn't mean someone like you, Ben, isn't going to be just as excited when they discover it and see that it checks all of their boxes yeah. as the person who like saw it right at launch. Yeah. You know, even if it would be nice to have like your money in the past. Yep. That's a good point. No, that's really wanna, you, you said something earlier that I really desperately yeah. was fighting to not forget to say something about. Yeah. Um, talking about the the feeling of like seeing other people's successes and like feeling I, I guess the word for it is like regretful or like I guess imposter syndrome -y about yeah. your own state. Um, one of the earliest things that I learned, and I'm sure that this was helped by Gun and Slinger going gangbusters, um, was that you you cannot truly compare yourself to others especially in an industry like this yeah mm -hmm. um the the trick to a lot of things is to be be stoked about what you're doing and do it as long as you enjoy it but also like something that truly gives me gas for for doing this is like being able to be on twitter.com and see my friends yelling about the cool shit they're doing yeah yeah one of one of my favorite favorite things about being in this industry is seeing people make cool shit um and just on the chance that i get to be a part of helping that be real is so so cool yeah yeah um, and it's also like people don't realize how kind of unique the creative process is in a lot of ways mm -hmm. within yes. not even just like games but like indie rpgs in particular like a lot of board games you're not seeing like the play testing process in real time you know you're not getting early editions of stuff you know a lot of the time you're like people don't even talk about it until it's very late with like novels or poetry or things like that people will do like interview circuits but other than like maybe a preview chapter here or there like a lot of other industries keep things much, much closer to the chest yeah. as far as what you actually have access to. And so like, it is a very cool thing about this space that you have so many opportunities to like hype just, so many different yeah. things that people are doing, yeah. you yeah. know, as opposed to just saying like, well, this friend of mine is going to release a novel every five years <laughs> and I better save up like all of my gems so that I can cash in like our social media currency when they really need it. Like you can just be like a steady supporter for someone's work and make a real difference. There are, <laughs> if you ever scroll back through my Twitter history, one, you'll see a lot of shit posts. Um, but what, two, with a handle like fork 20? Yeah, where I would, uh, um, but I, you will like very, very regularly see me post something like, so excited for all my friends doing cool shit today like and it, it's it's true it's it's just awesome to see people doing cool stuff yeah and to have this kind of insight into the creative process yeah to be able to be on the receiving end of someone sending me a google doc or a paragraph and it it's awesome and yeah. i haven't i 
I did YouTube for 10 years, um, which is its own kind of creative field. Yeah. And it is nothing, nothing like this. Mm. Um, you'll send somebody a script and they'll ask you a couple of questions or you'll post a video and it'll get a few views. Um, but even, even when those did great, it, the feeling is so different than mm. it, it's not as powerful of a feeling as when something I release or I show something to one or two people and they react strongly to it. Like it's, it's such a different, uh, different sort of emotional punch, if you know what I mean. Do you think the difference really for this industry is that it's about play? I mean, that it, at the heart of all this is something very playful and so therefore fun and... I, I I think that I think that the I mean I did I did games YouTube specifically okay. and, and and I think that you know it's it's still very much about play I think yeah. a part of it has to do with when you post something on YouTube.com there is <laughs> there's a kind of culture around YouTube videos where people forget that there is a human being that uploaded that video that sat down and wrote that video played this game for hours and either loved it or hated it enough to write a video for ten minutes talking about it people forget that there's that human there and i i think that with indie rpgs and the space that tyler and i uh, live in um is inherently a lot more personal yeah um and i think that that has to do with how i mean the things that we make come from a different part of the heart and the soul um, that speaks more to us than it does to how we feel about something. Yeah. Yeah. It's also, it, to a degree, it is the medium is the message, though, of like, mm. you know, people engage with critical media by criticizing, you know, and True. a lot of people engage with like communication storytelling media by like telling stories about their play experience. Yeah. You know, like it is more common that you are going to get someone. <sighs> Like, um, I think the best itch.io review I've ever received and that probably was ever written about any game, uh, it just happened to be about one of mine, um, was someone saying just like, five stars, this game is great. I love to play it with my friends. <laughs> yes. I was like, oh, yeah. Here. Yeah, great. <laughs> best review ever. Fantastic. Yeah. Love to see it. Yeah. Because that's what, like, that's what they know we're interested in hearing. Like I, they are, they know that like, okay, this game is asking me for, to like engage with it on this like level of fun. Whereas there are some people who will like see uh, a YouTube video or listen to a podcast and be like, not able to tell that like, oh, this is like a conversation that I am encouraging you to like have with me and but also like have with other people and have with this game as you play it. Like I am providing you with a critical lens where a lot of people think that like, oh, you're criticizing this game um, and that means you like this game. And so I'm going to criticize you to show that I like you. There, there's a lot of very, very strange and unfortunate uh, angles that people take in YouTube comments, and hmm. I, I feel like I don't really need to say too much more. Than yeah, that. I love yeah. that Little Mermaid <laughs> song. Strange and unfortunate angles. <laughs> Strange and unfortunate YouTube comments. Yeah. <laughs> well, so to go, to talk about the, like the one of the things I was thinking about earlier when we were talking about relationships and like what makes it work when you're like working with somebody and being and you're in a relationship with them and like you know like what you're describing with Jam. I was thinking one of the leadership. There's someone I read his writing. He writes a lot about leadership in the Christian space specifically. Um, uh, but he writes about leadership also just for like business. His name is Kerry Newoff. But he talks about how like work-life balance is a myth. And his viewpoint on work-life balance is that instead of thinking about it as balance, think about it as just being passionate about all of the things that you do. So if you mm -hmm. make something, be passionate about that. If you with your family or your partner or whatever, be passionate about that and just be enthusiastic about like all the different aspects of your life. And I like that way of thinking about it, but I see that never in, in like the way you talk about like your work, like even if you look at your website, right. And it's like, what's the first thing you see about the way you talk about your games? It's enthusiasm. It's like, you know, this, the, my games are fucking cool and you're going to think so too. And then that's, <laughs> but like you extend it out to like, 
the other people that you, you know what I mean? You're talking about other creators the same way, right? Like this person is awesome. I'm enthusiastic about what they're making. It's really cool. You should check it out. There's something about that that energy, right? That's contagious and positive. I don't really have a question into this. Like it's just, <laughs> it's not, I was going to try to form this into a question that didn't kind of manifest. But... It, just, it just didn't show up. <laughs> well, to like connect it to I... our discussion of like co-working relationships yeah. too, is like the best of those come from enthusiasm. Yeah. You know, like Nevin and I are good, like designer cohort. Uh, members because we're enthusiastic about each other's work yes. you know like at no point are we sending each other snippets because we're like oh i should foster this relationship because it might benefit me later on you know like the wrong way to go about like it's so working bad. with people in this field is being like if i do something for this pe person maybe i'll be a stretch goal for them later yeah like yeah. the right way to go about it is like this person's doing cool stuff and I'd love to be a part of that. Yeah. You know, as small as mm -hmm. it is, even if it's just like giving a thumbs up emoji. I also want to say like, first, thank you, Ben. Um, but that, that energy is something that I've really been working to foster for uh, the entirety of my online experience. Mm. Um, the YouTube stuff that I did, uh, it was for a channel called Indie Bytes, um, which from the ground up, um, I built to be a celebration of indie games. Um, and funnily enough, Jam was fully along for the ride for all that too. Um, she did a lot of the designs. She helped me hunt for a lot of things. Um, but that, that, that project, Indie Bites, the ideals behind it have always been find the cool things that people aren't talking enough about and talk about them as loud as you possibly can. Mm. Um, and talk about them in interesting ways. None of the videos I ever posted were, here's a flat review of this game that nobody's ever seen. It was always, here's this game that I think is cool as hell, and here's why I think it's cool, and I'm going to talk about that why. Like, one of my favorite videos I ever did um, was about how, uh, I can't remember the name of the game, uh, Below Zero, um, about how this indie first-person survival game where you're stranded in an Arctic base succeeds in making horror, truly, like, terrifying horror out of a completely mundane situation with, like, no paranormal aspects. Um, and that's a very long-winded way of saying... I, I try to shout about those same things yeah. when I see people doing cool shit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a contagious energy and like, it also kind of like makes it, I don't want to, I don't know the way I want to say this doesn't feel right. Cause it's not exactly right. Which is like, it makes it more receptive. Like it makes it easier to receive when you're enthusiastic about what you're working on. If you're, when you're simultaneously enthusiastic about things other people work on, but it's not self, -ser that makes it sound self-serving. Like it's not, I don't know. I yeah. think that like there's, I think I understand what you mean, honestly. I think it's also refreshing sometimes to read or play a game that clearly likes itself. Yeah. Too. <laughs> yeah. You know, there are a lot of games texts that are written in such a kind of like clinical way yeah. that it Couldn't isn't clear me. that like Absolutely the author had could fun. not do it. I, I <laughs> you know? clearly, I, I legit like when I when I started designing games, I tried to make things that were very procedural, or were were very like this is how you play the game. Please pick up these dice and roll them and see what happens. And I I hated it. <laughs> But now, it's, Nevin Holmes has returned to procedural gaming with Jessicar, a court <laughs> procedural. I I do my best to get, you've you've read it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I've been on Reddit r slash cats with jobs. It's still it's still a silly game. I no. I managed to like I I have learned to take something as boring isn't the right word, but boring as courtroom procedures and make them here's how you're going to follow here's how you're going to pretend to be in court and have a great time doing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people, I don't know, like there's a whole different discussion that we don't have time for in terms of like tone policing and things yeah. and, and mm -hmm. multiple spheres that, you know, uh, like beyond what we're qualified for, but there's so much loaded about even the concept of a professional tone 
existing. Yeah. You know, like, because how many professional environments have you been in that you aren't like desperate to leave at the end of the day? <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's a good point. Like, why are yeah. we trying to emulate that in our like fun time texts? I spend I spend eight hours a day in a professional environment. I don't want to do it when I'm writing a book. Please. <laughs> no. Well, I always tell people with church stuff, too. Like, I'm always like, we have meetings, you know, for church. Like, like we have, like, um, you know, our, uh, like, annual meeting with the congregation. I play games with them because I'm like, if we're not having fun, why on earth are we here? Because, like, this is a volunteer. Like, nobody, you don't have to be here. You're not getting paid to be here. If we're not yeah. having a good time laughing, having fun, I don't want to be a part of this thing. Like, so, mm -hmm. let's, so I hate, like, I I hate meetings that have to use like Robert rules of order and be like real serious and like like calm fuck off like I just don't want to be a part I just don't want to be a part of it so yeah. anyway why we'd want to do that in our um, games game time texts I I couldn't begin to really if understand. I if I really stretch my brain, I can see a reason for it in like very specific context of yeah, this sure. game's purpose is to be like that. Sure. But yeah. even then you're writing it like that because that's that's the point. Yes. Yeah. In in some way that's there's Yes. When we when you write a game, you write a game how you write it for a reason. Yeah. I did a whole article about this on dicebreaker.com. Okay. Well, I think like a good example <laughs> is um the like mo mothership modules that are coming up that are written in the tone of like the Weyland Yutani equivalent of like the Soulless Corporation. Yeah, so like, funny. That is effective because it's a horror game. Yeah, and it you know and it gets it. Like that's <laughs> yeah, that's such like a core conceit of like that genre and those like inspirational yeah, like, materials. Professionalism is something to be horrified by. Yes, Pro professionalism, <laughs> professionalism and red tape in the face of an unimaginable terror. Yeah. Is it Which so isn't terrifying? to say like there are degrees of professionalism, you know, sure. like a, a professional thing to do is also not to like flirt with your coworkers yes. or, you know, like go to the bank and treat it like a people zoo. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But it's like the kind of like the, the capitalist professional mythos yeah. that is like very much a like you're, you desire, you deserve to be docked in your pay if you don't use the right punctuation. Yeah. There is a, on on that note, there's a video game that recently came out called Hearthstone. I don't know if I believe that. You don't know a video, you don't believe video game? When was video the last game. time a video game came out? I don't know. <laughs> They're so straight. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a video game that recently came out called Hard Space Shipbreaker, and it is like, the epitome of like sci-fi post-capitalist horror um it opens with you like reading about one of the first thing it does is makes you accept in character terms and conditions and the very last one is i will vote for president of this company in the next election and it's uh, it opens with all this text about how and it's very professionally like it's a it's a terms and conditions doc that you read through and it's like um, I will work for this company and I, I'm, I'm going to make so much money, right? Like this going up into space on these dangerous jobs is going to make me so much money. My family back home is going to be so perfect. And then you start the game and it immediately jumps to acoustic banjo and a child praying for her father to come home safe. And you accept more terms and conditions as they destroy your body, <laughs> give you a clone body and put you hundreds of millions of dollars in debt. Yeah. That's the game where you like have to sh fix ships or something, right? Like you're yes. you're going and yeah. cleaning up like wreckage. Yeah. So Josh, my co-founder, Apon co-partner, my partner at Apon, um, was has been like trying to get me to play this game. He's been raving about game. it. He was just talking about it yesterday. You should play that game. Yeah. Yeah. For nothing but come, the... come for the breaking up big old ships. Stay for the the like Stay for the anti capitalist, anti -capitalist story. rhetoric. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It, it it right right now. One of my friends who might be watching this is going. Ah oh, yes, Nevin is praising something that's anti capitalist. Fucking Speaking device. of anti capitalism, though, <laughs> Nevin, you've launched a new website. We're in the process of. <laughs> <laughs> we I. <laughs> Speaking of anti-capitalism, this I, is the I'm, no, I'm, I'm genuinely curious, though. Like, yes. as we get 
towards the end of the show. Yes. Uh, like, there is a very clear action point for how people can support me and compensate me for my good words. Um, and that is to go to my Kickstarter and pay my rent. Exactly. I was um, going to say, this is the plug part of the show. So you, yeah, you, but beautiful segue. like Nevin, as you like, I feel like a lot of what you are doing is refining your process right now. Mm -hmm. So what is the best way that people can support you and like stay in the know for something that is like less in the, like the train is rolling mode and more in the like, Hey, everybody like start lining up at the station. If you head to dinoberryjam.com, you can sign up for a newsletter there uh, where we will like be announcing when the new stuff is ready. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter uh, where I will be announcing when our brand oh, Twitter is ready and when the website's up and stuff like that. It, it should be a couple of months, I think, um, before everything is like up and ready. Um, and you can also check out our Discord, where I post too much about too many things, uh, including the, the progress on, on stuff like this. And that Discord is bytes.rip slash Discord. Bytes.rip slash Discord? Yes. And that is with a Y. Right. It comes from the, any bytes. The, the cool hacker bytes. Um, but I'm yeah, just we're joining we're, the Discord as we speak, it. so just don't mind me. Hell yeah. Hey, look at that. There just, you go. You're in. <laughs> just joining the Discord. I'm uh, going to go to the introductions channel and wave to say hi. There you go. Uh, uh, please it, don't. Those <laughs> Discord, like, I did Muppet it. emojis. I got, the cute, I got the cute little floating robot. It shouldn't be a freaking, like, <laughs> gotcha pack, whether you get the nice waving robot or, like, the Tyler, horrific alien I like armadillo. It. I like Tyler. It. I don't know how to tell you this, but um, Ben did just wave hi to himself. Also, I so did. You are. <laughs> <laughs> I did. That's what's happening right now. Um, I but think yeah, we're um. Emojis Dino... were a mistake. <laughs> um. But yeah, D Dinoberry Press uh, will be launching and public uh, soon. Cool. And awesome. We're... In, in the meantime, um, follow me on Twitter. Uh, if you are interested, you can uh, pre-order Just a Car by going to the Just a Car Kickstarter page and hitting the pre-order. But what if button. I want a game and not just a car? If you want a game, then you can go to dinoberryjam.com. We sell physical copies of all of our games that are currently physically available. Well done. Well done. Uh, you can't. You're going to have to try harder than that, Tyler. <laughs> I, I can't. I've tried as hard as I can. Uh, Tyler, um, give us a plug. Give us your plugs. Plug, plug, plug. Yeah, um, you can find everything I do at possibleworldsgames.com. Um, I try and keep the website pretty efficient. Um, just if you're looking for my games, go to games. If you're looking to buy the games, then click the buttons. It'll get you there. Uh, and if you would like to follow me on social media, I'm on Instagram. I don't post much, but you might see some pictures of Ziggy. Uh, That's a good reason to follow facebook uh can't die fast enough <laughs> and uh on twitter i am possible w games uh because you can't fit possible worlds games into a twitter handle it has a character limit and so my press has a middle name it is the <laughs> same as mine and it is william uh, so possible w games now i know your middle name me too yeah <laughs> have fun with my social security numbers <laughs> well everybody get should it. go back uh be Feather and Bone call Atlas right now. If you want to be the 708th backer, you can be really wow. quick to head oh, over. Oh, that's great. And wow. get, get there. Uh, 17 days to go. Maybe somebody watching this will put it over the $10,000 uh, threshold because it's pretty close. It's like $61 away from hitting the 10K. So someone watching this, go back for $61 and, and you can claim that for your uh, two oh. more things for my plug period real yep, quick wait, uh, text from my partner one it's leo a public house is the bar where you go and you just tell them the good alcohol and they don't let you pick your drink what was it again um, leo leo a public house a public house cool. uh, and then so uh, also all caps wait so is twitch streaming just like live podcasts for games <laughs> yeah <laughs> <Ta -da>. really <laughs> 
having, not wrong. Having, having had podcasts, I don't like being accused of being on a podcast. Yeah, yeah there's <laughs> there's in a more rotten hive of villainy than the Apple podcast charts. Yeah, I mean, I started doing my interviewing career doing a religion podcast, and now I have transitioned to doing interview on stream. And I know there's something about it being live and being able to interact with the chat that just just makes it so much more fun than uh, yes. You know, I had a months. podcast for a number of years uh, as a way to stay in touch with my two best friends. Uh, and frankly, we were surprised and embarrassed when we found out we had a listener base uh, that was awesome. upset when we missed an episode. Um, but <laughs> I will be back eventually into the podcasting realm. I will submit myself to its horror once again. Uh, as my best friend Jordan and I launch our podcast, um, my son is also named Boruto. <laughs> Uh, where we watch all of Baruto <laughs> and explain what is going on uh, oh to people God. who have never watched Naruto or Baruto. Hey, Tyler, put uh, message me as soon yeah, as I'll, that Yeah, I'll put a pin wrong. in that. We're going to need a lot of guests. Wow. Uh, and they can't know anything about Baruto. Hey, I don't know anything hey, about other than the fact so that we, <laughs> Other than the fact that we need more Baruto license plates, um, <laughs> which was the alternate title. Uh, I, ben, all you oh need to know God. is that Naruto is a ninja who wants to be mayor, and he had a son, and he named his son Baruto. I've never heard the word Baruto oh, okay. until this stream right now. I've never. I, hey, I want you, welcome. Ben. I want your. I want your impression. Treasure this um, moment. What? D disregarding the fact that you just learned that Boruto is Naruto's son, what do you think? What did you think Boruto was when you first heard it? What was the first thing that came to your head? When I heard the word Baruto. Yeah, yeah. Like I, a type I of say car I'm starting a, a Baruto podcast. Uh, I don't know. My mind. This is holy happy hour. So I went to like, what is this bar thing? Is it like, is this a drinking <laughs> thing? Yeah. Is no. This Baruto is like a drinking thing. This is the new borrowers anime. The hit borrowers license. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, we'll be keeping our uh, <laughs> our podcatchers. I, I'm ready. doing my due diligence. I've watched all of Naruto, and now I am reading all of the manga of Naruto oh. because someone needs to be a Naruto expert on this podcast, and it might as well be me. I'm sorry. I I unironically <laughs> really not, like Naruto, not, not but terrible, that's a conversation but... for another time. Well, speaking of conversations <laughs> for another time, one thing we didn't talk about at all in the show was religion, and sometimes we do, hmm. and sometimes we don't, but. Feel free, both of you, to come back anytime on Holy Happy Hour, and we can talk about anything, including spirituality, religion, or not. Yeah, or you don't even know that I went to a conservative Christian college and was exactly. deeply scarred by it. We will. Yeah, have, that didn't even, even come Tyler, up. Tyler, we do you don't need even to have that conversation. <laughs> that needs to happen. So, yeah. You don't even know that I was raised Southern Baptist and didn't accept ah. that there were things other than uh, you know Christianity in my life until I uh, had the only. <laughs> you really beefed this one, Ben. Let it go, Ben. <laughs> We, get, we just have you back on the show. I have my Bible just off screen. We just need to have we just need to have you both back on the show, and we can talk about religion. I would love to do that. So, yeah. All right. Well, this we do have to. We I promise everyone we are raiding over into our other Apon show that's on next. So I'm gonna send Tyler and Nevin to my digital green room. Ask them to hang out there for a few minutes so I can say goodbye. So thank you both for coming on the show. Deeply appreciate it. And now away with them as I send them to, oh, except for here's something I didn't anticipate. The overlay's messed up because there's two of you on the Zoom call. So, <laughs> uh, so here's the thing. I don't, they can't hear YouTube, but hold on. I can, let's see, how can I move? Yeah, we down. <laughs> I'm gonna try to, there we go. I did it. I solved it. All right, cool. I know it's so ridiculous. Speaking of being professional, I am nothing but on this show. Um, I do have a script. There we go. Huge thanks again to my two awesome guests, Tyler and Nevin, for coming on this special two-part episode. It was absolutely a blast, and uh, I hope you all enjoyed it too. Don't forget, please don't forget to hit that follow button if you're watching us on Twitch, or you can s consider subscribing to my channel to help support what we do. If you only got part of tonight's show, you'll be able to watch it for a brief time on Twitch On Demand, but you can head over to allportsopen.com and watch every episode of the show right there on our website afterward. You can also, and I would highly advise that you do, subscribe to Holy Happy Hour Batman on YouTube. 
Um, I'm trying to get those YouTube numbers up. So, so speaking of YouTube, so subscribe to our show on YouTube and uh, don't forget to hit the bell so you can be notified when we go live, uh, when we have new episodes of the show go up. Uh, huge thanks to Joshua Wise, my Apon co-founder and uh, partner. Uh, and he did the artwork on the stream. So huge thanks to Josh and for everything he does to keep the lights on at allportsopen.com and help us and keep the network going. Huge thanks to Dr. Octorock for the use of his music on this show. So I am Ben, a.k.a. That Gamer Priest. Come back next week. We have another great guest coming on the show. Jabari Weathers is joining us next Monday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 4.30 p.m. Pacific Time. So don't miss that. That's next Monday night. Enjoy the holiest and happiest of hours, my friends. Hold tight. Don't go, any, don't go anywhere because we are going to raid into the worst days, one night of Slumpo. Sorry, I said that wrong. It's one night at Slumpo's. Don't go anywhere. Raid, the raid is coming. Mm -hmm.